tonight. Summit underway. President Biden opens NATO's 75th summit emphasizing unity against authoritarian threats. Peaceful alternative. Modi urged Putin for a peaceful Ukrainian resolution, emphasizing battlefield solutions are ineffective. Poll stable. Polls unchanged following first presidential debate. Candidates maintain steady support as election day approaches. Lion Cup freed. Rescued Lion Cup Freya finds haven in South Africa's ethical sanctuary. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We have a comprehensive coverage of stories for you this evening. Our top story revolves around the latest diplomatic maneuvers, particularly focusing on the NATO summit. NATO's summit this week takes place at a crucial time as Ukraine continues to fight against Russian aggression, while leaders are expected to seek ways to deal with China. Zelensky and US President Joe Biden delivered speeches today at the Ronald Reagan Institute, which marked the start of the NATO summit. With Russia's deadly airstrike on a children's hospital in Kyiv on Monday still fresh in their minds, U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed members of the largest military alliance in the world to the U.S. Capitol. The three-day NATO summit that started on Tuesday is all the more significant as the military alliance celebrates its 75th anniversary this year. Kicking off the summit was a roundtable discussion on women, peace and security. Later in the afternoon, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg made a speech along with President Biden, who looked back on NATO's history and the current role of the military alliance. However, the prolonged war in Ukraine is expected to be the main agenda item at this year's summit as Ukraine looks to regain momentum for support. The U.S. has passed five different bills since the start of the Ukraine war, pledging 175 billion U.S. dollars, including most recently in April over $61 billion. NATO member countries have also pledged to maintain annual military support of around $43 billion. However, with former U.S. President Donald Trump's chances of returning to the Oval Office on the rise, it leaves some question marks over whether the U.S. contribution will continue after January 2025. At the same time, the summit itself may be the final test for President Biden's capability as not just a U.S. leader, but also a world leader who has been at the forefront of several global conflicts during his four years as the November presidential election is mere months away. Meanwhile, President Yoon sung yeol is expected to hold 10 bilateral summits on the sidelines of the NATO summit, including a four-way meeting with three other Indo-Pacific nations. Yoon will express concerns over deepening ties between North Korea and Russia while looking to cooperate with NATO members and Indo-Pacific partners in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Taking a look at Modi's visit to Russia, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi told Russian President Putin that peace is crucial and the Ukraine war solution isn't on the battlefield. Putin praised Modi's efforts for a peaceful resolution, highlighting their special strategic partnership. That will be seen around the world. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi plants a hug on Vladimir Putin as his first state visit to Russia in five years got underway. Dear friend, you are welcome. I am pleased to see you. New Delhi is caught up in a tricky balancing act as it looks westward by diversifying its arms supplies while at the same time not alienating one of its staunchest allies. Narendra Modi's visit was criticized by Ukraine's president who said it would be devastating for peace. This despite the fact that the Indian Prime Minister once again told Vladimir Putin to his face that this isn't a time for war. I have always told you that peace is a must for a bright future. So we believe that war is not the solution. A solution cannot be through war. When we see innocent children dying, then the heart pains. And that pain is very horrible. Modi's comments come a day after Ukraine pointed the finger of blame at Russia for targeting a children's hospital in Kyiv. 
But while the Indian Prime Minister may have delivered a statement in Moscow that will please Ukraine's Western allies, he did say the friendship between the two sides remains strong. Modi's presence in the Russian capital will also be used by Putin to illustrate how he isn't isolated on the world stage. Staying on the topic of Modi's visit, India's Foreign Secretary reported that Russia will discharge Indian nationals misled into joining its army in Ukraine. Prime Minister Modi emphasized their early release to President Putin as New Delhi has prioritized their return for months, urging continuous communication with Moscow. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Yes, Sanuri. Since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia in February 2022, thousands of foreign men, including many young South Asians, have been recruited to fight for Russia. In Nepal, it is estimated that 14,000 to 15,000 Nepalis are on the front line, lured by promises of high salaries and fast-tracked Russian citizenship. However, many recruits, such as Indian nationals, have been tricked by human trafficking networks finding themselves unwillingly in combat roles. India's Central Bureau of Investigation has identified 35 such cases with some Indian nationals already returned home. Recruits, like those from Nepal, report receiving minimal training before being thrust into combat, leading to traumatic experiences and casualties. Back to you, Sanvi. Thank you. That was Alderna World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Heading over to Asia, Malaysia said it will seek to finalise plans and sign a full-fledged pact with Singapore to deliver a special economic zone between the countries in September. The neighbours in January agreed to develop the ZIZ in Malaysia's southern Johor state just north of Singapore, aiming to attract investment and free up the movement of goods and people. Malaysia's Economic Minister Rafizi Ramil announced that the final agreement for the Johor-Singapore Special Economic Zone will be signed ahead of the leader's annual retreat later this year. He expressed confidence in meeting the deadline for the agreement. The SEZ proposals include a passport-free immigration system, cooperation on renewable energy and simplified business approvals. Plans for the SEZ include development of Iskandar Malaysia and Pengarang district areas known for business and oil and gas industries. The SEZ aims to attract Western and Eastern investors, leveraging Singapore's sophistication and Johor's cost and resource advantages. Medical experts in Japan added a more severe category to the heat stroke index, warning that extreme heat is straining medical services and causing public health damage to a natural disaster, aiming to reduce heat stroke deaths. The Japanese Association for Acute Medicine said it would add a fourth category to the three-level classification later this year in an attempt to reduce deaths from heat stroke. The announcement came in the same week as authorities in Tokyo said six people had died from the effects of a heat wave that has sent temperatures as high as 40 degrees Celsius in some parts of the country, well above 35 degree thresholds classified by weather officials as extremely hot. The association said that the death toll from heat exhaustion has risen from a few hundred a year two decades ago to around 1,500 in 2022. The sheer number of fatalities suggests that heat stroke now poses a danger on par with that of a major natural disaster, while urging people not to go outside unless absolutely necessary. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House, polls for the presidential election have remained steady nearly two weeks after President Biden's performance during the first debate. This comes as Biden has said that he is staying in the race despite calls for him to drop out. Hello, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Tonight, nearly two weeks after President Biden's disastrous debate performance against Donald Trump, the presidential race is still remarkably stable. I am running and going to win again. 
New national polling shows President Biden still trailing former President Trump, but his debate performance only costing him a point or two. In the battlegrounds, Biden actually making up ground, pulling one point closer to Trump after their primetime clash, but still running behind. The question every voter should be asking themselves today is not whether Joe Biden can survive a 90-minute debate performance, but whether America can survive four more years of crooked Joe Biden in the White House. Despite Biden's insistence that he's staying in the race, Democratic voters divided about the best path forward. Go get him, North Carolina. Biden's decision about whether to stay in the race influencing one of the other big choices of the 2024 campaign. Thank you very much. Who will join his opponent, Donald Trump, on the Republican ticket? Trump telling Sean Hannity of Fox News no final decision has been made, but Biden leaving the race could sway him. We wanted to see what they're doing, to be honest, because, you know, it might make a difference. He's reporting Trump has narrowed his search to three finalists, Senators J.D. Vance of Ohio and Marco Rubio of Florida, along with North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. Two campaigns at a crossroads as November closes in. Taking a close look at the continuing hurricane situation, soaring heat in Houston worsened the plight of millions without power after Hurricane Beryl raising frustrations over the city's preparedness. State officials faced scrutiny over whether Houston's power utility was adequately prepared for the storm. The scope of Hurricane Barrow's destruction seen from above. Downtown Houston flooded, cars washed away, and homes crushed. Today, this family watched as crews removed a fallen tree from their house. They were inside when it came crashing down and the water began pouring in. The U.S. death toll from the storm now up to 10, including two from carbon monoxide poisoning and one person whose oxygen machine ran out of battery. The remnants of Barrel now wreaking havoc in the Midwest. Overnight, 110 tornado warnings were issued, the most ever for a day in July. In Louisiana, mangled metal and debris strewn for miles. Back in Houston tonight, another threat. More than 2 million people are without power in scorching triple digit heat. Now heading to Australia, an explosion got at a factory in Durham at Melbourne, igniting a massive fire. Over 180 firefighters battled the blaze. No injuries were reported, but toxic fumes led officials to advise nearby residents to shelter indoors. Thick smoke and flames engulfed the sky in the Australian city of Melbourne after a huge factory fire broke out that reports said was caused by a chemical explosion. Around 180 firefighters and more than 50 trucks were responding to the blaze, adding that it could take days to contain it. The Australian media reported that the roads around the factory had been closed and the people were urged to stay away from the area. For a new update on the UK, newly elected lawmakers filled the UK Parliament today after the UK's transformative election brought Labour to power, with 335 of 650 House of Commons members arriving for the first time, compared to 140 new lawmakers in 2019. British lawmakers were sworn in as Parliament convened for the first time since British Prime Minister Keir Starmer won a large majority in last week's election. As per custom, the longest-serving lawmaker Sir Edward Lay was sworn in to the so-called Father of the House, followed by Prime Minister Keir Starmer, members of his newly constituted cabinet and the Shadow Cabinet. Keir Starmer led Britain's Labour Party to a landslide victory in the 2024 parliamentary election, taking over from the Conservatives after 14 years in opposition and named his new cabinet last week after polls. Opposition leader Rishi Sunak set out his shadow cabinet with some senior ministers such as MPs Jeremy Hunt and James Cleverly reprising the roles they held in government prior to the election, while former Foreign Secretary David Cameron resigned. For an update on the ongoing war, Palestinian officials said that Israeli airstrike in southern Gaza Strip killed more than two dozen people, while advancing tanks in Gaza City forced residents to flee under fire as Israel stepped up an offensive that Hamas warns could jeopardize ceasefire talks. Bodies piled up at Nasser Hospital in southern Gaza on Tuesday as Israel stepped up an offensive that Hamas warned could jeopardize ceasefire talks. 
Palestinian medical officials said an Israeli strike nearby killed dozens of Palestinians, most of them women and children. The airstrike hit the tents of displaced families outside a school in the town of Abbasan, east of Khan Yunis. And Palestinian medical officials say at least 29 people were killed. The Israeli military said it was reviewing reports that civilians were harmed. It said the incident occurred when it struck with, quote, precise munition, a Hamas fighter who took part in the October 7th raid on Israel that precipitated the nine-month-long Israeli assault on Gaza. Meanwhile, Hamas's media office said Israeli strikes elsewhere in central Gaza killed 60 Palestinians and wounded dozens of others, including a strike on a home in al-Nusrat, which killed 17 people, most of whom were children. Meanwhile, residents said advancing tanks in Gaza City shelled roads and buildings, forcing them to flee their homes. This was followed by Israeli military orders posted on social media to evacuate several districts in eastern and western Gaza City. The Palestinian Red Crescent transported dozens of injured from a hospital in Gaza City on Sunday and Monday, but on Wednesday said that its crews were unable to answer dozens of distress calls due to the intensity of the bombing there. Israel's renewed campaign has threatened talks at a crucial time, as senior U.S. officials are in the region to push for a ceasefire after Hamas made concessions last week. Hamas quoted its leader as saying that the latest fighting could bring negotiations, quote, back to square one. Heading over to Europe, the European Space Agency Ariane 6 completed its maiden flight, releasing satellites into orbit. However, the mission faced challenges as the upper stages visited engine demonstration, crucial for multi-orbit missions, did not proceed as planned. The European Space Agency's Ariane 6 rocket launched successfully on Tuesday on its maiden flight after a delay of four years. Coming a year after the retirement of the predecessor Ariane 5, Europe's newest unmanned rocket, weighing 540 tons and standing 56 meters tall, blasted off from the launch pad in Corro, French Guiana. Ariane 6, which cost some 4.3 billion US dollars, began development in 2014 by the Ariane Group, a joint venture between Airbus and Safran, after the European Space Agency nations agreed on the need to respond to growing competition in the commercial launch market. It's going for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. A special friend who has had a life of hardship so far finally finds a way to safety. Here's a look at Freya, the Lion Cub's road to recovery. Freya the Lion Cub may seem over it, but she's just arrived at her new home in South Africa. The six-month-old was found in the illegal trade of wild animals in Lebanon. She was rescued before the possibility of a lifetime of abuse and maltreatment that so many other exotic animals endure. Freya will take a while to settle in at Drakenstein Lion Park, a sanctuary where big cats that were born in captivity have the chance to roam free across its 60 acres. For now, Freya is safe safely adjusting to her new environment behind a fence, but soon she'll join the other lions who are housed there. As an ethical sanctuary, Drankenstein will not participate in captive breeding programs or allow visitors to interact with the lions. Experts say Freya will never live in the wild. She simply hasn't been equipped for survival, but thankfully she can live out her days at Drankenstein. And that concludes our World News Roundup for this evening. We we'll return tomorrow with more vital updates from around the globe. Stay tuned as we'll be back shortly with the nightly visit report. Thank you for watching and good night.